Okay, our subject is uh, church discipline, but before I do that, I want to just kind of add one more, if I can, little illustration about uh, what it means to be in fellowship. I uh, appreciated what Mirza shared and wholeheartedly agree with what he shared, uh, but I want to just uh, add something. If you look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, just for a moment, Luke chapter 5, and the word uh, fellowship uh, is the word koinonia in the Greek language. Uh, kind of has the idea of holding together in common. Um, it's used here in Luke 5, verse 10. It says, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And so the word uh, fellowship, koinonia, is used here of partnership in a fishing business. And the idea is that these, um, these men, uh, they, they work together in the business and they shared in the blessings of the business. Okay? That's, how it, that's what real fellowship is in terms of local assembly. We work together for the glory of Christ and we share in the blessings that come. So I'll give you an illustration, one quick illustration. In November this year, November the 11th, I'm going to down to the Bahamas to a little island called Spanish Wells. And uh, there's a nice assembly there, and uh, uh, they asked me to go down there once a year and speak, which is a rough assignment, but somebody has to do it, So, and especially in November. So anyway, I'll be going down there. But they, they're lobster fishermen. That's what they do for a living. And um, how they work is that they, uh, there'll be a group of them that will club together, and they will buy a boat. Boats are not cheap. There's quite a bit of an upfront expenditure to buy the ship. And then they do a lot of work in order to harvest lobsters. They'll go out to sea and they'll put these little kind of habitats on the bottom of the ocean. And uh, lobster is the kind of the cockroach of the sea. It likes dark places. And so they go into there and they breed prolifically just like cockroaches. And so they'll, they'll put these habitats down, they'll mark them. And then later on in the year, they'll go and they'll, uh, as they reach full maturity, they'll dive down tip over the habitat, and then spear the lobster, and then bring them on board. And it's, it's you know, start spearing the lobster, there's blood comes out, and then sharks come around. I mean, this is, this is tough work. This is really pretty serious stuff. So I said to them one day, I said, look, I would like in on one of your boats. Okay? I, I don't want to put any money in. I don't even want to do any work. I might come along for a journey occasionally and sit on the deck chair on the deck and just read a book and get a suntan. But when you get your profits, I want an equal share. Now, not one of the boats would have me on board. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what's wrong with these guys? I'm a nice fellow. What's the issue? It's because I wanted all the blessings and none of the responsibility. And when we talk to people about what it means to be in an assembly fellowship, we need to tell them there's responsibility, but there's also a blessing. And we want you to share in the blessing, but you also have to be willing to share in the responsibility. So we go through the privileges and responsibilities of assembly fellowship. And that's why it's really important. So now we come to the issue of discipline. I want to look at first the first epistle of John. And um, we're... Now, when we think of church discipline, we automatically assume, you know, the kind of final act where you literally, we've been talking about receiving, assembly receiving somebody into fellowship, and when we think of church discipline, we think of the, we actually think of the final act of the assembly putting them out. But that really is the last step in a long process, right? That you, you actually want to if, do everything you can to avoid that last action, you want to prevent that if you can, because it's not, a diff not an easy thing. But I, I want to think about when we do put somebody out of fellowship. Uh, look at 1 John chapter 1 just for a moment, and I'm going to read verse 5. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Isn't that wonderful that there's no dark side to the Lord? We're not going to find out a thousand years into eternity, that there was some sinister dark side to the Lord that we hadn't learned about. No, no, no. In him is no darkness at all. Praise God for that. That's a wonderful truth. And so then it says this, 
and there's no darkness at all in him. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we're walking with the Lord, and we're walking in the light as he is in the light. What if there's a believer, and we've been talking this week about carnality, and what if somebody has given over to carnality, and, and sin has become a habitual practice in their lives, and it's serious? What is, what is that telling us? Well, they're clearly out of fellowship with the Lord, right? They're not enjoying communion with God because to walk with him, you have to walk in the light as he is in the light. And if you're walking in darkness, you're not enjoying fellowship with him. And so when an assembly puts somebody out of fellowship, all they're doing is actual, actually making real what's already been going on for a long time. This person's been out of fellowship with the Lord for a long time. We're just acknowledging that, right? And it affects the whole assembly. If somebody amongst us is not walking in the light, you ask the nation of Israel, uh, how's that fellow Achan getting on? He's hindering the blessing of God's people, right? We're going from great victory to shocking defeat because there's a man in the camp that's not walking in the light. Right? So it really affects the testimony. And so that's why we've got to deal with this issue of church discipline. So church discipline, what are we even talking about, really? It's, it's actually uh, God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ exercising spiritual authority through the local church for the purpose of reclaiming an erring believer on the one hand and maintaining purity of the assembly. I hope you got both sides of that. Part of the purpose of discipline is we want the brother back. Right? We're not doing it because we're mad at him and we want rid of him. No, we want him repentant. We want him restored to, to fellowship with God and fellowship with us. And so we discipline because we want restoration. We want the erring brother back. But we also discipline because we want to maintain the purity of the local assembly because we're concerned that just as Achan caused Israel to suffer defeat and loss of power, that if we have sin in our camp that's unjudged, we will also lose power and victory in the assembly. Okay, so these are pretty serious things. The problem of church discipline is that we're living in an undisciplined society. S scripture speaks of discipline at multiple levels. And so let me just give you some examples. Child discipline. Right? If we don't discipline our children <laughs> properly... If they're in rebellion against their first authority figure, don't be surprised if they end up in rebellion against God and everybody else, right? In other words, we've got to deal with it right at the source. So, so if, we, if we want to avert church, dis, uh, church discipline, it might be good if we teach our families how to discipline their children in love, but how to do it. Like, we need that today. Now, whether it's legal in Canada or not is irrelevant, so whether it's biblical is the matter. And we've got to be careful, obviously. You don't want to be doing it uh, in Walmart, um, in, in the general public, right? That's not the place to do but we do need to discipline. And again, there's a balance between discipline and love, right? That's, but we need discipline. And so the problem is we don't have, and, and so you have, you know, kind of the difficulty of people who have never, ever known discipline in the home what kind of a life is that going to produce? The very word disciple and discipline sound a lot alike, don't they? Is that a surprise? <laughs> because it's a disciplined life following the Lord Jesus. And then there's the idea of, uh, and let's just look at some scriptures here. I just want you to uh, look at 1 Timothy um, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. 
One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to care for his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And so basically, a man can't be an elder if he doesn't discipline his own children. How is he going to discipline in the assembly? He's not going to, right? If he's not a, not a disciplinarian, he's not going to be a disciplinarian in the assembly. He's going to be lax, going to let things go. And so discipline is important. Uh, church, uh, uh, child discipline. Self-discipline. Look at 1 um, Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And after a week up here, this is challenging to read this verse with a clear conscience because <clears throat> the opportunities for lack of self-discipline have been great, especially uh, the magnificent fare that's been served us in the kitchen. But he says, Know ye not that they which run, run in a race, run all, but one receives the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so there's a certain sense of self-discipline. We need to encourage, the, and we talked about the three Ds, right? And one of them is exercise yourself rather unto godliness, right? The discipline of the Christian life. And we need to teach Christians how to live a disciplined life, how to have a disciplined quiet time, how to keep short accounts with God, how to walk in the light. We need to teach these things. We, they're not necessarily going to get it by osmosis. We need to instruct people, not only about child discipline, but about self-discipline. And then there's another aspect of discipline, and this is divine discipline. Uh, you know, the Lord is very faithful to discipline his children. Hebrews chapter 12, and um, you know the passage well. And uh, it's a very important passage about chastening. And um, it, he uh, talks um, here um, in Hebrews uh, chapter 12. He says, um, <clears throat> for, verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chast chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them which are exercised thereby. And of course, we know, uh, verse 6, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. It's actually a mark of how we know we're really sons. A mark of sonship is Papa Spanx. Right? Lord disciplines his children. I'm glad he does. I'm glad he doesn't leave us to our own devices. I'm thankful for the correcting hand of God in my life. And I'm sure we all are. When we've, we've experienced his discipline. Right? So, so we've got this, this, uh, this biblical culture of discipline. From child training to uh, self-discipline to divine discipline. And now we want to think about assembly discipline. You know, several passages that deal with it. We'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at also at Matthew 18. We're going to look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, different passages. And by the way, when it comes to divine discipline, uh, maybe I, I should do this before I go to assembly dis discipline, but let me just go to 1 Corinthians 11 in terms of divine discipline. Because it's already been mentioned, but it'd be good to mention it again. Look at verse 30. Um, well, let's break in verse 28. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinketh unworthily, eats and drinketh damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay, do you notice that? So in the assembly at Corinth, they obviously weren't faithful in discipline. We're going to see that in chapter 5. But the Lord was faithful in discipline. Right? And some of them 
were weak <laughs> and sickly, and some of them were asleep. Now, it wasn't an after-lunch session in the assembly after too much carbohydrates that we're talking about here. They were physically dead. We just used, as, as Mercer rightly said, that's a term that's used of believers who have died. And who did it? The Lord. And what does he say? If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So if you want to eliminate divine judgment on you, then you better judge yourself. Right? That's the point. Before you, especially before you come to the Lord's Supper. It's a pretty serious thing. And again, the examination shouldn't be done when you sat there at the meeting. Because it might be you need to see somebody beforehand. Right? I mean, it, what, what, what is it if, if, if my brother, you know, if, if you've got a, an issue with your brother, before you bring your gift to the altar, what do you do? You go to your brother and you sort it out. So, so you don't want to be thinking about it while you sat there at the table. And you think of it before that, right? Am I, is there anything in my life that would hinder me from taking this expression of love to my Savior this morning? Anybody I need to see? Anybody I need to apologize to? Anybody I need to? There's a guy, when we were in Ireland, there was a guy that we, we, we I don't want to go into details, but many a Lord's Day morning, he would be at the, at the gate of the assembly waiting for me to come to apologize before he would break bread. I appreciate him for that. And then it went, <laughs> he went back to doing the same thing again. But, 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 but he, would, he didn't ever take remembering the Lord lightly. And I appreciate that about it. And so we've got to be serious about these things. Self-judgment eliminates divine judgment. Um, and again, um, let me just say this. If we refuse to restrain, the time comes for God to step in. And so, for instance, we talk about child training, but remember the sons of Eli. God stepped in. He disciplined them. And then what did he do? He spoke to Eli and said, because you didn't chasten your sons. He failed. <laughs> so God stepped in. So we need to be sure that we're, we're administering self-discipline, that we, we take discipline serious in every way. So assembly discipline, look at 1 Corinthians 5. And I want you just to see, why is this so critical, so important? He says, it is reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, what does it mean it's reported commonly? In other words, the word had got out. It was known, even outside the assembly, that these people who were claiming to meet together in the name of the Lord Jesus were, were so lax in their morality that there was actually an incestual relationship going on in the assembly and nobody was doing anything about it. It was just going business as usual. And so he says, you're puffed up. And I'm not rather mourned. By the way, I, I think that's an interesting thought here. That um, when an assembly experiences something like this, Paul says you should have come together and had a time of mourning. I, I think there's room for a time of mourning if somebody has done some act that has caused the whole testimony to be in the headlines for the wrong reasons. Isn't there a time for coming together to mourn? It's a time of brokenness. Well, this happened on our watch. It's very serious, very sobering. Uh, he said, have you not mourned? You're puffed up, you're proud. They're proud of their, you know, their tolerant, liberated spirit. That's what they're pr proud of, puffed up. And I've not rather mourned that he that done this deed might be taken away from among you. So let's just, uh, before we go further in this passage, let's just think of the reasons why church discipline is nece necessary. First of all, we might say this, the holiness of God and his house. We're, we're the temple of God. 
ye, First Corinthians 3, we've looked at it several times, are the temple of God. And, and the, Holy, the Spirit of God dwells in us too. Like uh, that's, He's the Holy Spirit, right? So, so again, holiness becometh thy house, O God. Psalm 93, verse 5. Be ye holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. First Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. And so there's this important thing of, of the idea of the holiness of God in His house. It's also discipline is a true picture of love. Again, because the law says, um, whom he loves, he chastens. So discipline is an act of love. And by the way, if you're doing it for any other reason other than love, for the individual and for the name of the Lord, don't do it. Get somebody else to do it, right? In other words, it must be done out of love. You love the erring brother, you want them back. Right? It's got to have the right motivation. We love this person. We don't want them to continue on like this. If we fail to discipline our children, it, 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 the question mark hangs over our heads whether we really love our children. Look at Proverbs 13, 24. Don't just take my word for it, but let Scripture speak. For, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 24 says this. He says, um, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times or oftentimes. Now let me tell you, my, my oldest boy, who um, <laughs> talk about, I don't know how many paddles we broke on him. And I, I wondered if he would ever get it. And I want to tell you, I had no pleasure in doing it. I can remember one time just tears running down my cheeks as I spanked him again. And I'm thinking, is this kid ever going to get it? <coughs> it's heartbreaking. But if you love your children, you do not leave them to their own devices. That's not love. I'm glad God didn't leave us to our own devices. He steps in. And so it, it's love. And so it's, it's necessary because of the holiness of God's house God in his house. It's necessary because it's a true picture of love. It's necessary for the testimony to a watching world. If we're no better than the world, if the conduct among saints is no different than that of the world, what kind of a lampstand do we have? It's not a very bright one. And, and so in Corinth, bad news travels fast. It's reported commonly. <clears throat> The very thing that they're doing ought not even to be mentioned among the saints. It's an it, it's a incestual, incestual relationship that goes back to Leviticus 18. Uh, Le, this Leviticus 18 passage is the reason why God threw the Canaanites out of Canaan. This was one of the sins. And here it is in the assembly of God at Corinth. And so if it was known commonly, it was also known in the assembly as well as in the watching world. And so testimony to a watching world. The other thing that in 1 Corinthians 5 is this, that ignoring problems causes problems. Right? How do we know that? Verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. What does that mean? We, we've, we've heard about that this week, isn't it? Right? It just leaven spreads. And so it's not that everybody in Corinth is going to be committing incest. That's not the point here at all. The point is, though, that if you can get away with incest in this assembly, by comparison, what I'm doing is no big deal at all. So I can do my thing, whatever it might be. And so there's a culture in the assembly where there's a complete lack of fear of God and everybody can do their own thing. And it spreads. The whole, the whole immorality, whatever, the whole unholiness spreads fast amongst the saints. And so it causes problems in the long run. <clears throat> if he can get away with it, and my sin is nowhere near as bad as his, because we tend to categorize sin, so I can get away with it too. And of course, we've already talked about the impact of unjudged sin in the camp. 
The story of Achan in the Old Testament reveals the result was a lack of spiritual power. They couldn't even beat little Ai. And I wonder how much of a lack of power in our assemblies is directly related to sin in the assembly. Unjudged sin in the assembly. Just look at 1 Timothy for a second. Chapter 5, verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Would you say that one of the marks of contemporary Canadian culture is a lack of fear? Fear of God, I mean. Would you say that? Would you say there's a lack of fear of God in the assembly of God? We're living in pretty casual days. And could the fact that discipline is maybe not being done, shied away from, be the reason that there's a lack of fear? So why is it neglected? Well, first of all, fear of man rather than fear of God. If we do this, well, and especially in assembly circles, listen, we're a bunch of inbreeds. We really are. We, we need to get some people saved from outside because we're all intermarried. Isn't that true? I mean, you've got to be careful what you say in an assembly because uh, the person you might be talking about is related to half of the assembly. And so part of the reason we don't do things is, well, you know what's going to happen if we do. All his kinfolk are going to stand with him rather than standing with the Lord. That's a tragedy, isn't it? So we, we avoid it because if this hits the fan, you know where it's going. It's going to be terrible. And so fear of man rather than fear of God. People will get upset. People may leave. People may sympathize with the person. And so we don't act because we're more fearful of what people will do than we are of, of the holiness of God and his righteous standards. And at the end of the day, we're going to give an account to him, not to them. Right? He, he's the Lord. And so we've got to lose this fear of man. This idea of favoritism, family and friends. That's one of the biggest difficulties. Scripture calls it respect of persons. Someone who clearly needs discipline and yet because of close family connections, it's not dealt with. Even a simple admonishment is unacceptable because that's my boy. And so it really comes down to a lack of belief, unbelief in the clear teaching of the Word of God, uh, a failure in leadership because discipline is painful, it's very difficult to administer, it's often misunderstood, and it's rarely appreciated initially. So we might be tempted simply just to pray about the matter. But God does command actions accompanied by our prayers. <laughs> yes, we should pray about it. But we should do something. Just look at Matthew 7. I want you just to see something here because this is uh, one of the most quoted verses of the scripture. M Math Matthew 7. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it, it, it shall be measured to you again. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then notice what it says. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So people stop at the first verse, judge, that you, judge not that you be not judged. And then the Lord goes on and say, actually, first of all, you've got to make sure that when you're doing the judging, 
that you don't have a big log sticking out of your eye, right? In other words, you make sure that you deal with your sin first. Galatians 6, you that are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of meekness, right? In other words, you've got to make sure that you're in a right relationship with the Lord before you would ever attempt to confront another person about their sin. And so he says, get the log out. But then he doesn't just stop there. He says, then go to your brother and remove the speck that's in his eye. Now, again, you've got to be careful. When you're dealing with people's eyes, the eye is one of the most sensitive parts of the human body. So if you're going to go and remove a speck out of somebody's eye, don't go prodding around. Do it real gently, right? But, but do it nevertheless. So in other words, it's not a cop-out here. It's telling us to do it, but to make sure we've dealt with our own sin first so that we're in a right relationship with the Lord if we're going to be involved in enacting any kind of discipline. And of course, um, we, we want to just talk about the fact that this is where it all begins, isn't it? It begins with one individual seeing sin in another individual's life and going to them personally. And then, of course, we know from Matthew 18 that if they don't respond, you take somebody else along. And then if they don't respond when two have gone, because everything's confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses, then you bring it before the whole assembly. By the way, am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely. I am my brother's keeper. And so we have to love one another enough to lovingly confront when we see them going astray in some way or another. If a man be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual. And by the way, you know, let's ask each other the hard questions. Are you holy, brother? Are you looking at things you ought not to look at? How's your thought life? Let's ask each other. Let's encourage each other. Right? Exalt one another daily while it's today, lest we, the deceitfulness of sin gets us. Right? This kind of relationship where I'm, I, we love one another enough to ask, how's it going? And let's be honest with each other, vulnerable. Yeah, I'm really struggling in this area. Will you pray for me? It's good, right? We want to avoid this. We don't want to get to this stage where it's a church issue. Another reason why we don't do it, not only failure of leadership, not only faulty thinking on judging one another from Matthew 7, but fear of lawsuits. We're living in a litigation society. And that's why we talked about the importance of reception and having some kind of thing in writing that says that you, the person, understands what it means to be in fellowship in that assembly and that discipline is part of what goes on in the assembly, something they can sign. It's really important because it, it may become a litigation issue. And by the way, there have been cases where assemblies have actually lost their buildings in lawsuits. And I know of one particular case, the person said, they never told me any about, anything about this, and now they've sullied my reputation. And they had nothing in writing. And they lost their building. So that would make us a little bit gun-shy, wouldn't it? So, again, that's why... That's why I'm so glad that Mercy did what it means to be in fellowship before we talk about discipline. Because if you don't receive them as an assembly corporately, you can't put them away corporately as an assembly. So this is not just mere academic stuff. This is really important. If you don't have a proper reception policy, you're making it very hard on yourself to be able to enact scriptural church discipline. You're really making it difficult. So what, what kind of issues merit discipline in the assembly? Well, <clears throat> what about personal issues between brothers that won't be reconciled? Uh, look at Philippians chapter 4. I'm just going to go through a list of suggested issues that require. And again, I'm not talking about putting out of fellowships the last step. So I want you to keep that in your mind. Uh, it's, uh, and we want to do everything we can 
not to get to that step if we can help it, right? It's much better if we can deal with it beforehand. And so he says in Philippians 4, very familiar to us, uh, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Let me just sit, stop there. So we know the story. You did, you, Odious and Syntyche, Syntyche um, were sisters that have clearly been used of God. We're going to see that in the next verse. But right now they weren't getting on. And there was, there was obviously contention between them. And the difficulty with, with this is that it never just stays with the Euodius and Syntyche. Because Euodius have, has got those that sympathize with her, the Euodius party, and Syntyche, well, she's got her friends, you see. And if these two don't get reconciled, pretty soon, if this continues to fester, you're going to end up with two assemblies. That's how it usually works. Right? So we've got to bring them together. We've got to somehow get reconciliation. And by the way, I, I feel even in terms of the gospel, if we won't be reconciled to one another, how can we go tell the world to be reconciled to God? It just is a bit hollow, folks, isn't it? So we must make sure that there's true reconciliation among us. Because it's just it's lame to go out and tell the world, be reconciled to God. They're going to say, well, you guys, you're fighting like cats and dogs. I mean, right? It's not good. It's not healthy. And so verse 3, he says, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. We're not quite sure who this true yoke fellow is. But he's, Paul's given him a mission. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, and Clement also with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So here's an area where the church has got to get involved somehow. How can we bring these two sisters together? Right? And, and I know of assemblies where there are people. I remember one assembly, actually in, in Ireland. And there was, there was a, a, a man and a woman. And I don't know what happened, but they wouldn't talk to each other. And so when the cup was going around in the loaf, they wouldn't pass it to each other. Somebody else had to come and take it. Now, why they were breaking bread, I have no idea. Like, if, if you're out of fellowship with your brother, surely you're out of fellowship with the Lord as well. Right? But this is going on. How can the Lord's presence... Mercer talks about doing everything right and the presence of God being there. How can the Lord's presence be in a meeting like that? And so help them. Help those. And then he talks about how useful they've been in the past. And that's the, that's the sad thing. There can be people who have been really used of God, but they get bent out of shape. And then they're, they're a liability. What a blessing they've been in the past, but not anymore. Unless we can get this sorted out, this beautiful assembly is on, on potentially on the verge of being torn apart. Help them. And so two members who will not be reconciled. And of course, it never ends with two. Uh, refusal to work. I don't know how that would work in Canada. I have no idea. But Second Thessalonians... One of the problems in Thessalonica, there was an interesting problem. Uh, they, some of them were so convinced the Lord was coming, they quit work. That sounds good. You know, like why, you know, let's just get at it. Let's get at the gospel. But they ended up, they really didn't do anything except were busybodies. Going around stirring things up. And so he says, now we command you, brethren, verse 6 of chapter 3. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which we received of us, but you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. And so here are people that just won't work. It's interesting, I was preaching on my way through 2 Thessalonians one time, and I got to this passage, and a guy just stormed out of the meeting. He was really mad. And anyway, I managed to chase him down, and he said, you were preaching about me. And this guy, he never worked. 
He was on the, the dole. And doing rather well, by the way, with all his benefits. And I, I didn't have anybody in mind. I was just teaching the passage. The power of the Holy Spirit to convict. Anyway, he got a job. Praise the Lord. Isn't it wonderful when somebody responds to the Word of God? By the way, that's what we want. That eliminates so many problems if people just respond to the Word of God. It eliminates so many issues. But again, refusal to work is a very serious thing because they become idle busybodies and gossips and it's considered to be walking disorderly. Doctrinal error. Of course, how do you begin? Well, 2 Timothy, you begin with patient teaching, don't you? You, uh, you don't just... Uh, uh, you, you, you try very def definitely to present truth in a, in a godly way to them. Second Timothy 2, verse um, 23. Am I in the right passage here? Verse 23. Yeah. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patience, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who were taken captive by him at will. And so uh, patient teaching, corrective teaching is, is needed, but w w what if their Refusing to change their doctrine. Well, rebuke comes in. Romans chapter 16. Where somebody who is pushing false doctrine should be rebuked publicly by the assembly. Romans 16 verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them, for they are such as serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So there's uh, avoiding them. And um, it's at Galatians chapter 2 here, verse 14. And when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before all, them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Now, isn't that interesting? You talk about courageous. This is the Apostle Paul. And notice what he's doing. He saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter before them all. Would you publicly rebuke Peter before everybody? <laughs> I mean, this is like, I mean, he's a pretty significant individual, isn't he? But Paul rebuked him. Why? He's embracing Galatianism. So, so a rebuke, avoidance. Um, and again, the leaven of false doctrine. If we don't deal with false doctrine, what happens to it? Right? A little leaven, Galatians 5, and <clears throat> verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So we just can't tolerate false doctrine. Open sin, we saw in 1 Corinthians 5. Should never have got to the part of putting the man away. He should have been confronted long before that. You that are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Galatians 6 should have occurred long before 1 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> Just a key guideline in discipline. Private sin should be dealt with with private confession to the elders, but it should be dealt with privately. Don't, everybody don't need to know. But public sin requires public confession. The whole sordid details don't have to be given to the church, but just as a general principle, private sin needs to be dealt with in a private matter. Public sin needs to be dealt with in a public matter. The purpose of church discipline is the removal of leaven 
is repentance, to bring the erring brother to repentance as a prelude to restoration, and then finally restoration. Love delights in seeing sinners restored and even wayward saints restored to fellowship with God first and then with one another. So how do we go about the process of church discipline? First of all, it must be done with caution. Um, time to think, wait, pray. Um, not a case of putting it off, but we need to make sure we're in the right frame of mind uh, before doing this. Just a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 18, verse 13. It says, He that answers a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. And so the idea is we need, to, we need all the facts. We need to know everything about it first, right? Don't, don't just go on what the first thing you hear. Because it might not be the truth, right? You've got you to do proper investigation. And that's why, what I mean by uh, approaching with caution. Verse 17. He that is first in his own cause seems just, but his neighbor comes and searcheth him. And so sometimes the first person you hear, they've got a very compelling story, but you want to check the other side of the story before you do any action. Sometimes people have acted prematurely and got egg on their faces because they only got half the story. And so we need to approach it with great caution. Uh, it's very important. Take time to think, wait, and pray. Don't... Um, by the way, just as an aside, in... Um, even in child training. Um, I found with my own children that if I did it on the spur of the moment, it would be very easy to do it in a temper. And so I would ask them to go to their room and wait for daddy to come. And then I would get myself composed and pray <laughs> before I would go and administer the discipline. It always worked better. When I did it on the heat of the moment, it wasn't a good thing. In fact, I think I undid what I was trying to do. Right? So, and again, with discipline, approach with caution. First, after, after you approach, first thing is admonition. That's the starting point. Uh, Paul's convinced that they're able to admonish one another. Uh, the word admonish means lovingly confront. And it, again, I want to load it with that word lovingly confront. Right? So we're confronting something in a person's life. But we're doing it for love. We love this brother. We don't want him to continue like this. So it, out of love, we go and we confront. So, so here's an, a classic example. The story of David and Bathsheba. Right? What does Nathan do? He has the task of going to the king, by the way, who's pretty powerful, and saying to him, you're the man. Now, he did it, and by the Lord gave him great wisdom. He talks about sheep, you know. Remember David's background? <laughs> He's got a great sympathy for sheep, right? Just the, the wisdom with which he did it, but, but he did it, and he lovingly confronted him. And so, again, this admonition, um, uh, if we can lovingly confront the erring one, appeal to them before the Lord to repent of the wrong that you see in their lives. And then, as we've already said, additional witnesses may be needed if they do not respond to admonition. So again, Matthew 18, you first go and see your brother. If he doesn't respond, then you take other witnesses. And then you confront together this person. And, um, and you know, it's difficult. It really is. I, I, this is a true story. Um, uh, when we were in New Tribes, there was a there was a man who, we used to have open chapels every day, and uh, this brother, every time he got up, it was always the same message with variations on the theme. But the theme was, I, me, my, and myself. And it was nauseating. And every single day, without fail, he'd be on his feet. And you could almost feel the groan in the audience. And so, another brother and I were painting, uh, build, doing work detail, uh, painting a building. And he said to me, so, so what did you think to brother so-and-so today? 
And I said, you know, if we talk about him and don't go talk to him, we're in the wrong. But he was much older than us. We were just young pups, you know, so you kind of feel a little bit. So we prayed about it, and we said, we've got to go see him. And we went to see him. And, and you've you got to think in terms of not only pointing out what's wrong, but giving a strategy to somebody to how to get victory, how to, how to move forward in a positive way. So, so anyway, we, as we prayed, the Lord seemed to show us how to approach this. So we went to this man, and his wife was there. We went in, and we said, we'd like to talk to you. And we told them how much we appreciated them. And then we said, but we just, we just really feel we need to talk to you about this issue, that every time you get up, all you do is talk about yourself. And I said, it's disturbing to everybody. And so we want to just encourage you, first of all, that if you get up, try just talking about the Lord. And keep yourself out of it. And then what we've learned is that it, it might be good if you look at opportunities to serve others. Right? Because kind of the, the antidote to self-focus is becoming a humble servant. So it's kind of an interesting experience. The Lord really worked. I mean, we were, we were in fear and trembling. But the, the, the wife began to tear up and, and he thanked us and... You know, thought about it. And anyway, the next day he got up in chapel and you could just hear the tension in the room because, but he got up and he spoke about the Lord. And he and his wife ended up on the mission field running a missionary guest house serving others. And the Lord, the Lord worked. Now, you know, I, I don't like confrontation. I, I'm not a confrontation. I, actually, I'd rather go jogging. And I hate jogging, if you know anything. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I don't like this kind of stuff. But if we're really serious about the Word of God, there's times we've got to do it, as hard as it is. And so this, this admonition, this additional witness is needed, if there, especially if there's no repentance. We, we need this. And then, uh, finally, assembly action. And, and again, um, it's... It's the, it's the impenitence of the individual that is resulting in the discipline. It's, it's, it's the fact that the sin has been confronted in love, but there has been no response. And so this is the final kind of piece of the puzzle, is to put them out of fellowship. So what that does is it withdraws from them the privileges connected with assembly fellowship. And why do you do that? So that they'll feel the loss and they'll see the seriousness of their sin and they will want to be restored through repentance. Now when you do that, you know what? You've got a responsibility to do as well. Let other assemblies know what you've done. Because you know what happens? Somebody gets put out of fellowship, at least in these days, they go down the road to a different assembly. And that's why in reception, we've got to have care. We, we had an example of that where somebody was put out of fellowship and immediately went to another assembly and thanked the Lord. The elders there said, and this man had been an elder. <laughs> and so they said, we thought you were an elder in that assembly. Why do you want to come into our assembly? Are there problems? We'll receive you if you go sort the problems out and then come back. So he went to another assembly and they received him. Isn't that sad? But for the discipline to work, it has to be in other assemblies too. It has to be, if somebody's under discipline, so we don't believe in an open table. If somebody's under discipline, they're not welcome to remember the Lord at our assembly until they first go and put things right with their brethren. Making it work. Notice, back to 1 Corinthians 5, I want you to notice the, the authority for church discipline. Again, it's not us, it's not even the elders, it's certainly, it's, a, it's an assembly action, but I want you to notice the authority behind it. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 4, he says, um, <clears throat> let's just back up a bit, verse 3, For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath done so done this deed. 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Notice the authority. that he, It's in the name or in the authority of the Lord Jesus himself in this excommunication. And, and so, uh, again, that's the authority. Of course, it has the authority of Scripture as well. We're being obedience to Christ and His Word. And, <clears throat> of course, the, the, the punishment uh, of church discipline, and again, it's with a view of restoration. We've said there's public rebuke. Uh, another could be silencing. Uh, let me show you an example of that. Titus, uh, Titus chapter 1, where somebody could be silenced. And this is, this is an interesting, uh, Warren talked about the colorful nature of the Greek language, but Titus 1 verse 11, it talks about these Judaizers, and it says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. The word there, their mouths must be stopped, means they must be muzzled. It literally means to shove something in the mouth. Silence them. Stop them spreading this false teaching. They must be silenced. They, they can't be allowed to continue to spread this uh, false teaching. Um, another uh, aspect of the punishment available is, we say, the withdrawal of the, the elements uh, from the person, uh, excluding them from the Lord's Supper. They're not in fellowship. But... Uh, that's an, always is a difficult one, isn't it? So it, it actually says we're to treat them as a publican. Let me get back to the passage, uh, how we're supposed to treat them, 1 Corinthians 5. Um, it says, um, find the scripture here. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Oh, it's from uh, Matthew 18, isn't it? You treat them as a, a publican. It's the 24th session, guys. Don't be too hard on me if I get tired. <laughs> not the 24th session I've done, but I've been through all the 24 sessions. <clears throat> 28, um, Matthew 18, sorry. Um, Verse 7? Seven? 17. 17. Thank you. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now, a heathen man and a publican. Now, what does that look like to treat somebody as a heathen man and as a publican? So, if a heathen man came to your gospel meeting, would you put him away? If a heathen man or a tax collector came to your ministry meeting, would you put him away? No, you'd want him there. Why would you want him there? Because the word of God might convict him. So, so we've got to be careful here. Unless, unless there's some very strong moral reason, we, 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 he's not in fellowship. We're treating him like an unbeliever and a publican. Well, how do you treat unbelievers and publicans? Right? So, so the, he's, not, he's not treated like a brother. There's a difference. But he still can come and hear the word of God because you want him to hear the word of God because he may come to repentance. But you can't, you know, go and put your arms around him and say, oh, so good to see you, brother. What you do is you go up to him and say, we're praying for your repentance. Right? We're looking forward to the day that we can welcome you back. So, so we've got to recognize those, those things are very important. Um, interesting, 1 Corinthians 15 verse, uh, 5 verse 12, it says, What have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. So I, I just want you to notice that when we were talking in the previous session about 
the assembly, there's a clear within and a clear without in the local <clears throat> assembly. And I think that's part of the difficulty in many of our assemblies today is that there's no cl clarity of who's within and who's without. That should be clear. And so if you treat him like a heathen man and a publican, it's clear he's not part of the within group. He's without. He's, he's watching from the out, but he's not part of the within circle. There's this withdrawal of a fellowship. You don't treat him like a brother. Uh, we don't want to enjoy fellowship with him because it's condoning their sin. They're already out of fellowship with the Lord. We can't enjoy fellowship with them because they're not in fellowship with the Lord who we're in fellowship with. So you, you want them to come to this re repentance. And there's a, another aspect of withdrawal of fellowship, but there's also, and again, elders must still visit him in a capacity uh, not of comfort, but to encourage repentance and change your behavior. Uh, but there's a withdrawal of protection as well, to, live, to deliver such an one unto Satan. It means he's, he's outside of the protection that there is in the local assembly. All of that, that, that entails. And he's out in the world, in Satan's domain, in Satan's sphere. And, and so, again, the idea is that uh, he's out in the sphere where the Lord's authority is no longer owned, uh, the, the, and for the destruction of the flesh. Now, it can either mean the, the, the carnal nature we've been talking about during the week, or it can mean the physical body like first, uh, we saw in 1 Corinthians 11. The other side to all this is this. What if somebody is disciplined and they do repent? That's what 2 Corinthians is about. Receive them. Show your, confirm your love to them. And, and somehow, um, the restoration process is, is a beautiful thing. And, and if you've ever been part of it and witnessed it, when somebody who has been put out of fellowship, just recently, in answer to prayer, a lot of prayer, uh, a lady, she had, uh, she'd run off with a boss, she'd left her husband, left her children, gone into the world, been away from the Lord for 22 years miserable in her sin. And a lot of people were praying for her. And that's what we do for the person that's out of fellowship with we pray. Anyway, she came under deep, deep conviction, I believe, in answer to prayer. And she came back. She begged her husband's forgiveness. She came back to the assembly. She begged the elders' forgiveness. This lady was really broken. She's now happily back in fellowship. And she is just a on fire for the Lord. It's beautiful to see it. The restoration has taken place, and it's a lovely thing. So who's involved in church discipline? Well, the whole church, we said, again, that um, it's, it's an assembly action. The assembly receives, the assembly puts, it, puts away. Um, when you're gathered together, uh, it, you're gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus, it's His authority. Elders guide through the process. The elect angels even witness. First uh, Timothy 5, verse 20 and 21. Angels are interested in the church. They're witnesses to this event. And with the power and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of these things are involved. All of these individuals. And so some of the key passages. We, our time has gone. But uh, 1 Corinthians 5, Matthew 18. Um, 1 Timothy 5. Um, th there are some difficulties. Let me just mention one. We, ha we had an issue in our assembly, and it, it was a very serious sin. Uh, in fact, um, it, it concerned child abuse, and uh, the person um, repented, is restored to the Lord, but for legal reasons could not, after prison, come back to our assembly because the victims are still there. So, I mean, just legally, it's not possible. But can a person like that fellowship somewhere else? Well, first of all, if, you, if they're going to be recommended somewhere else, you have to tell the whole story, right? People have got to be aware of it, and they've got to be willing. Now, again, I, my con conviction is that 
I believe that the Lord can restore somebody fully, even if they were involved in something like that. But you would not put them in charge of the Sunday school. Right? In other words, you have to exercise tremendous care about someone like that. They can't be in a room with children on their... I mean, you've just got to watch. You've got to... And, and they've got to realize that. You, we can, you, you can be received, but there, there's parameters that have to be in force for you to be received. And this person is received and is, um, is from what all I hear, doing really, really well. Praise God for that, by the way. And, and, and again, we, God is a God of restoration. David was restored. Now, again, he, there was, he, his reputation was sullied to this hour, but he was restored to the Lord. And we've we got to be committed to restoration. Let's talk about preventative. You know, we talk about fire prevention. I'm just convinced we need to, we need to emphasize church discipline, I mean child discipline, self-discipline, true discipleship, and then the practice of admonishing one another. Let's try and avoid this. Let's do everything we can to avoid having to go through this process by holding one another accountable, by exalting one another daily while it's yet today. I, I think that's the, the key to this whole thing. But let's take it seriously and make sure that we understand the whole story and that we exercise great wisdom as we go through this whole process. And pray, pray, pray. Pray before, during, after. Pray, 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 pray. Very challenging things. There's a million other subjects I would rather have had to speak on than this one. But it's one that's needful. And I hope it's been a help. We've got five minutes, I believe, before we all take off. So... We're about to